teach us, not me, the screen. It's good to see everyone out on a Wednesday night. Let me, um, let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you that you have given us your word, and as the author of Hebrews instructs those um, he's writing to, uh, may we receive the word and not reject it uh, and cling to it, um, because your word, it is, it is life when combined with the spirit. So we ask that your spirit would come, and that through these studies that you would, um, that you would carry us along that you would carry us along in Christ. Amen. Well, uh, if you are just joining us or whatever, let me welcome you. My name is Kyle. I am one of the pastors here. And we are having a Jan term where we look for four weeks over. Uh, this time, our subject is the subject of perseverance in the book of Hebrews. Mind me, I'll be drinking hot stuff tonight because I have a little scratch in my throat. Um, so we're going to look at perseverance in the book of Hebrews, and during to the end is what I'm calling the series, and uh, perhaps it's worth starting off just asking, why study the topic of perseverance? What is so important about that? And uh, in order to start, why don't I just um, tell a couple stories to help you? So I knew... We'll change the names. Uh, I knew Danny since we were probably, well, since I was a sophomore in high school. Uh, he was in eighth grade. He was always a bit rebellious, and I got to know him more and more because when I went off to college, I became his intern in the youth group that he was part of. I took him under my wing and discipled him. Uh, he came to faith, actually. Um, right before he, my, the, I was started interning, so I had him when he had just become a Christian, and then, um, and then, he actually graduated from high school, went off to college, and he became an intern with me. At that point, I just continued to disciple him as kind of the older intern in the youth group, and he was the younger intern. He even went to study abroad with me in Austria for a semester, where we got to have lots of experiences together and share life. Uh, and then I went off to seminary, and slowly as I, as I came back uh, to Memphis, my hometown, to check in with him, I noticed that things weren't quite right. He was not involved in the Christian community quite as much. He was not going to church as much. He certainly wasn't leading anything. Uh, he was hanging out with a different crowd of people, and then more and more he started to drift. More and more he started to drift by the time... I came back from my PhD studies, it became very clear that he had left the faith altogether. So that's Danny. When I was in Austria, I met, we will call him Robert. Robert was a uh, self-professed agnostic, probably leaning atheist. He was actually an agnostic because it was more, he thought, intellectually credible to be an agnostic than an atheist, and he felt like that was, um, well, it, it, he kind of had some uh, snobbery about that because it meant that, that he knew that you couldn't be certain. He was certain that you couldn't be certain, unlike those atheists and unlike those Christians. Uh, but he found the things that I was saying quite interesting. We had some dialogues, and then all of a sudden he started coming to a Bible study that I was doing for seekers when we were in Austria. As I started going through this Bible study uh, and teaching, he came, he got more interested, we had more conversations, and then towards the end, I taught on the parable of the two sons uh, that Jesus teaches in Luke 15, and he came out even as an agnostic, and he said, I finally realized that I'm the elder brother even though I'm an agnostic, and that I, it's my goodness and my pride that's been keeping me from Jesus. I don't know what that means yet, but that's where I'm at. So he was in transition. He wouldn't say he was a Christian. It was a process. Uh, I stayed in, in Austria the next semester and studied. He went back uh, to his, Robert went back to his university at SIU, and then he came and visited me. 
uh, and he came decked out with his church clothes. I had gotten him a Bible for Christmas, a study Bible, uh, and he had been reading it, uh, and he came, and even though he didn't really own church clothes or have it, he, he wanted to go to church. Uh, he came to church with me. He started getting involved in a PCA church uh, right across in his hometown, right across the river in Illinois from St. Louis. I would visit him when I was at Covenant Seminary there, and, uh, and one day I even got the experience of taking a trip over the river about an hour away from Covenant Seminary to his home church uh, where he was attending. And there I got to see Joe, uh, or Robert, sorry, um, be baptized. And it was a very meaningful, profoundly meaningful experience for me to watch him be baptized into the new humanity. And he continued to grow into his faith. Uh, he was serving at his church. He was loving people. He was going on uh, short-term uh, mission trips. And they started to see lots of qualities in him, so much so that he even started diaconal training. Uh, he started diaconal training, and he went through that. I'm not sure if he was an ordained a deacon, but I remember having a conversation with him in seminary. I said, it's amazing that you'll be an officer in the church before I am, but... That's, uh, that's how God works. And, uh, and he's no longer walking with the Lord. He has totally walked away. And every time I go to Facebook and I see these two guys who I had deep and intimate relationships with, and I see their posts and I see where they are in life, it breaks my heart completely. And that happens probably once every week or once every two weeks that I see one of these, and it, it crushes me. That's a personal story. Here's one more. Uh, Pam grew up in a church in St. Louis of a pastor who was a gifted evangelist. Uh, he brought many, many people to the Lord. Uh, one of the people that you uh, will maybe know if you're a sports fan is Joe Buck. He brought Joe Buck to the Lord. He's an announcer, or maybe his dad. Is it his dad? Anyway, uh, announcer for St. Louis Cardinals and, uh, and such. And then he's also been instrumental in the life of one of our elders, Mark Garaza, this, this pastor. Uh, he, he, he actually, most of his uh, session were converted by him. Uh, they actually, he was pers utilized personally and evangelized him. Evangelized them. This is the church that Pam grew up with. After he left, um, some it was a disaster at the church. They had some rough years, rough times. Uh, session split, church split, elders left. And in the midst of it, there was one elder that was particularly close with Pam's family growing up that had kids around her age. Uh, and he is now in the midst of this decided that he is not a Christian anymore, rejected the faith, an atheist. So I tell these stories because I think that we all deal with this question. We've all had experiences like this. How do you persevere? What do we do with these people that fall away? How do we help them? This is a massive question. I would imagine that I just by... Maybe you'd be okay to say by show of hands. I'm guessing most people in here. Uh, how many of you have known someone that you were sure was a Christian, walking with the Lord, walking with Jesus, and has subsequently, from all intents and purposes, as much as you can see, they've walked away from the Lord totally? How many of you can say that? Okay, almost, almost everybody, maybe 90%. How many of you had someone who either led you to the Lord or have taught you or been instrumental in your life who have walked away? Anyone? Okay, a couple of you. And that's, that's normal for a group this size. So the question is, is, is I think that this is a, it's a big question. It's not an academic question, though it can be an academic question. Of course, uh, the question comes up, the, the debate, uh, can people fall away or not? Are they eternally secure or not? Can you lose your salvation or not? And some of you might have heard of Calvinism and Arminianism and some of the differences there. And, but even amongst Calvinist circles, there are some questions about how to understand all that and even some reappropriation of understanding that, uh, those things. I mean, 
But it's not just an academic debate, is it? It's, we see it around us, and then it's not just that we see it around us. Like I mentioned, it's also some of our own struggles. Right? We, we also struggle with this question uh, because the reality is, is that, that we face situations that are difficult, perhaps because of being Christians, and we're tempted to give up. Maybe it's that by being a Christian, you've had a hard time getting a, a post in an academic job. I was at an academic conference two months ago uh, in November. It's called the Society of Biblical Literature. It's an academic conference where people study the Bible. That's what we do. Uh, and it's, it's a bunch of scholars. And I was there with one of uh, my friends who is brilliant, Uh, He works for a think tank in Washington that's connected with Georgetown, and he basically is a Syriac scholar who studies Syriac text. If people knew, like, what he does there, he's kind of like, ah, like everybody's like, this guy's brilliant, right? Uh, One night we were there, we were all kind of talking after the seminars and stuff, and as we're talking, uh, he just made a suggestion that Paul might have written the pastorals, and how, you know, and decided to throw that out there. And you could have seen, like, he just got taken. It was like, whew. And at that point, the next day, he started getting hate mail, saying you, there are certain things. Because he said, he goes, well, I would think that in an academic environment, these kind of questions and live debate would be open. And they said, and this is literally, and I heard this guy say to him at a table the next night, he goes, man, there are just some questions you don't ask. He goes, you're blackballed. You're totally blackballed. And he came up to me, and then I, he asked me, because I'm a Paulinist, I study Paul, that's like what I do in, besides this, uh, but in my former life, I study Paul, and I'm a Paulinist, and so he asked me, well, you know, you don't think that? And I was like, well, I mean, I, I, think, I, think, that there, I think there's evidence that could suggest that, yes. I don't think it's a close case. And then you should have seen how it came on me. Uh, and it was interesting, and then afterwards, because um, it wasn't like, it wasn't like, let's have a debate. It was like, you are an idiot, and some expletives in there. And I asked, I talked to my friend afterwards, and he goes, really what happened is they found out that I was a Christian, and then they came down on me, right? But it's not just, I mean, that's biblical studies, right? It's not just biblical studies. That's biblical studies. Uh, but it's other places, too. Maybe it's a job in the academy. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's that you're in a marriage that's impossible, you feel is impossible, and you feel like following Jesus and being faithful to him is just too hard because he doesn't give you the right to leave. Or maybe you feel like being single and the prospects of getting married is impossible, especially if you just stick with Christians in Santa Barbara uh, and you're like, whoa, and, but there are these really kind, nice uh, non-Christians that are interested in me, and maybe you think about leaving. I talked to someone today, that was their story. They were in seminary, left seminary, because they found someone that they loved, and they weren't a Christian, and they walked away from the Lord for 15 years. Or uh, maybe, well, you know, it's, uh, it's like in Downton Abbey, right? In Downton Abbey, some of you may not have watched it yet this season. I'm not going to spoil anything, but I am going to give an illustration because it's just too good. So Edith is, uh, there's this guy that's interested in her, and they can't get a, he can't get a divorce in England. He's married, but he can get a legal divorce in Germany. So he's thinking about leaving his British like citizenship and everything, uh, to go to Germany to be a German right after World War I, mind you, <laughs> leaving England, becoming a German, and that, so that they can marry, right? And that's, he, that's just a prospect. And, uh, and, but that's, I feel like that is the situation that lots of, lots of Christians, maybe some of you are in, you're thinking about, I mean, that's a drastic move, but hey, I'm in love. So there's that, or maybe it's that there's discouragement, a physical ailment, joblessness, loneliness, uh, sinful habits that won't die, and after so long of it, you just kind of ask, is this stuff really true? Am I really in the spirit? 
Did I really die to sin? Like, is it true that he never leaves me or forsakes me when this happens and this happens and this happens and with this discouragement, maybe we're tempted to leave? Well, if you felt that at all, if you know anyone who's felt that, then this is the situation that the Hebrews are in. It's not a theological question simply, it's a practical reality, and it's a reality we all face. The book of Hebrews is a sermon, actually. Uh, It's unlike any other book in the New Testament, because uh, if you look at the rest of the letters of the New Testament, they all open with a salutation. You know what a salutation is, right? Salutations. Everyone says that, right, to one another when you're walking down the street? Salutations. No? Okay. But you know what it means, right? Greetings, right? They start with a greeting because it, even still, unless you're on like the second or third email, you still have to say hi, so-and-so, right? And if people don't, they're a little terse and rude, let's be honest, right? Unless you're texting, and that's doing away with all salutations, but we won't go there. Salutations, but this doesn't have a salutation. Uh, and then at the end of it, um, in turn, if you have a Bible, to chapter 13, verse 22, Uh, You get to the very end of the letter, and we read, I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation. Bear with my word of exhortation. Now, this idea of a word of exhortation, that kind of phrase only appears one other time in the New Testament. It's in Acts 15, when Paul is at Poseidon in Antioch, and they're in the synagogue, and they're asking him to give a word of exhortation, and they're basically saying, preach for us. You have a message, brother. You want to preach for us. So the book of Hebrews is not like a, a traditional letter. It's actually a sermon, and, and it feels like that, and we'll talk about that as we go through. But, but who wrote it? That's been an age-old question. That is very difficult to answer. Some thought Paul, especially in the East. Uh, But there's problems with that. Uh, The the reason some people think Paul is because, um, well, it talks about about Timothy there at the end in 1323. You should know that our brother Timothy has been released. And who's closely associated with Timothy? Paul. So some people think Paul because of that. Some people think Paul because, well, he writes theology, and there's theology in here, a lot of theology. Um, so there, there are some reasons why people think Paul, I even had a candidate, uh, I'm on the candidates and credentials uh, committee, which means I examine ministers and, uh, and, and one of the candidates he talked about, he kept referring to the author of Hebrews as Paul. So I kindly asked him to defend that, but I don't think it's Paul. Uh, and the reason is, is because it, well, there are numerous reasons, but the easiest one that I'll point out is. If you look in chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, it says, Since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. So does anybody know why that might be true? have a a problem with Pauline authorship? Anyone? Okay, that's one one, uh, suggestion. He wasn't there at the meeting when they heard? Yeah, so Paul heard and makes a big deal in Galatians about, I didn't hear or I didn't receive this from anyone else. I received it straight from the Lord, right? So this person is a second generation Christian. He was discipled by someone. Um, so, not Paul, there are other reasons, I think this book is heavily influenced, the, well, Paul doesn't write this, the Greek in this is very, very high, and Paul's Greek is a little bit more redneck, so let's just say that. I love Paul, but it's a little more redneck. And, and the other thing is, because of that too, this book has kind of middle platonic influences that Paul doesn't carry as much, but I won't get into that, that's kind of nerdy. What we will talk about is whether or not it's Luke, because some people say, well, Luke's a close companion of Paul, and he writes really high Greek, so that's another option. Another option is Priscilla. Some have suggested Priscilla, and I think that's a pretty uh, 
That's a, a good suggestion for a number of reasons. Priscilla, we know, taught. She taught Apollos. Uh, Priscilla went from Rome to Corinth, and we find uh, that there are some connections there. Um, but in 1132, the author uses, uh, talks about I and uses a masculine singular. So Priscilla is a woman, so it's probably not Priscilla, uh, speaking of I. The other uh, option is, I think, Barnabas. Barnabas, we know, was a priest, and so this book has heavily saturated in temple and priestly images. I think maybe the best option is the one Luther suggested, and that's Apollos. And that is because in Acts 18, we find that Apollos is a man who knows the scriptures well and is skilled in rhetoric. He was also associated with Paul, Corinth, and perhaps uh, Rome. Um, So if that's basically the idea is we don't know, and those are guesses. And I think the best guess is Apollos, but we have no idea. We're not sure. Uh, But what do we know? Well, what was the situation facing the Hebrews? Who are they writing to? Well, we can piece to get that a bit together. Look at Hebrews 11, 22 through 24. The writer uh, writes, I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. You should know that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. Greet your leaders and greet all the saints. Those who come from Italy send you greetings. Now, what can we guess about this audience, uh, who he's writing to, based on this. Anyone know? Okay, why do you say persecution? Okay, so there's the release of Timothy. And what else can we tell? Okay, so they're they're leaders. So the church has been around for a little while. Yeah. What about those who come from Italy? Why would that be important? If they're saying those who come from Italy send you greetings, then they're probably writing to Italians, right? It it would make sense that those who are from your hometown send you greetings, like you say, oh, if you see so-and-so, tell them hello. And that actually is probably more likely those who come from Italy are Rome, like Priscilla and Aquila, when they were, they had to leave Rome, uh, Because in 49 AD, the emperor named Claudius, he rendered an edict, and he basically said, all Jews out. And Priscilla and Aquila had to go, and that's how they ended up in Corinth. Uh, And so it said that they came from Italy. So all the Jews were out. And so these are probably talking about, um, uh, this is probably a letter uh, from some pastoral figure writing back to those in Rome. We can go a little further with this, Hebrews uh, 10, 32 through 36. But recall the former days when, after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with suffering, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those who were so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison. You joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. So what can we learn from this about the audience? A tough season... Currently, or it says in the former days. So this is a church that's been persecuted and actually endured. They made it through, right? Uh, And what happened, he starts describing this persecution in prison, confiscation of property, uh, knowing they had a better possession. Uh, So... What And then he says, they now, for you have need of endurance. So it seems that what we have is a congregation that was persecuted and is about to face or is facing persecution again, the second round. This makes sense because what happened is in Rome, Claudius sent all the Jews out in 49 AD, 
confiscated their property, took over their businesses, things like that. They were sent out. Roughly 54 to 56, all the Jews, a lot of them flood back in. But after they get their feet established, right, Jews were only persecuted, not Christians in, the, in uh, 49. But then another, uh, another emperor comes along, roughly 10 years later after everyone comes back in, and, and he isn't so kind to Christians. Anyone idea, have any idea who he might be? Nero. Right, so Nero, uh, who knows that, that he said that he he had a you know he was playing a fiddle as Rome burned. We're not sure about that, but at least the rumor spread fast. And so we have, uh, and in in that he he did at some points in some ways use Christians as a scapegoat. That being said, uh, what it seems that we have is that we have a congregation in Rome. They've pa- faced past persecution, they've endured that persecution, but there's severe persecution ahead. And we can tell how severe it is because when they talk about what's going on, they say uh, in 11, 32 through 38, um, it says, what more shall I say for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Baruch and uh, Samson? And it goes through these kind of Old Testament saints, but then it starts talking about those who were... um, made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put armies uh, to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking uh, mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. Uh, these are pretty, I mean, you know, when it starts talking about being sawn in two and stuff, that's pretty, like, gross persecution. So they're probably facing something like that. And then if you look in 12.4, we know, though, that it hasn't happened yet because it says, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. So it's potential persecution, but we're not sure that it's actually risen to that mark yet. Ed. I don't know. I would, but I don't know whether or not... uh, My question is on the evidence of whether or not the discussion of the temple means that the sacrifice is still going on. I can see where you say that, though, because of the temptations to go back. Yeah. Um, So, what was the situation? Well, they're in Rome. Whoop. Come on. Severe persecution... And there's something else that you should know, and that is this, uh, that during this time, even though the Jews were all kicked out under Claudius, once that edict was revoked, uh, Judaism as a whole, under the Roman Empire, had certain rights and privileges. You see, everyone else had to worship the emperor, uh, and they had to be part of the emperor worship. And so it was kind of like, you can have your religion, but you have to worship the emperor too, and we're okay with kind of polytheism uh, and polytheistic kind of multicultural religion. It, except since the Jews, they found out, wouldn't do that, and since the Jews like get really mad and feisty, and since there were a lot of them, and since it was an old religion and the Romans kind of liked that, uh, there were lots of things that the Romans kind of admired in certain respects about the Jews, and they gave them a certain dispensation where they didn't have to worship the emperor and they were protected. So, but that's not the case with Christianity. If you were a Christian, you could face persecution, right? But if you were in the synagogue, you wouldn't have to say, uh, we worship Caesar, he's Lord. You wouldn't have to do that. Uh, You wouldn't have to pay tribute to the emperor in that way. Given that being the case, uh, what, oops, no, all right. It'll come, maybe. I don't know what'll happen. That being the case, what do you think would be the temptation of these Christians? Go back to the synagogue. I mean, if you're struggling, if you're, uh, if you're uh, hurting, if you're about to face a severe persecution, and 
especially if you came from that, your family might be there. They've kind of disowned you. You've come over to this Christianity thing. You're already getting pressure that, like, hey, you guys are the new kids on the block. What are you talking about? Like, we're the ancestral religion of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We have the promises. Who are you, Johnny, come lately? And you got all this. You got the persecution. You're poor. Most Christians in Rome, it seems, uh, lived in slums. Uh, you're being, uh, you know, uh, work conditions are bad. Food is bad. There's protection also in the synagogue because synagogues provided actually like what we might call today like a diaconate. So there were lots of provisions for those who were poor and needy in the synagogue. Whereas if you weren't in that, there weren't. There are all these kinds of things. And so basically the temptation would have been to go back. So that's kind of the setting. Having laid that out, let me, let me ask if, uh, are there any questions? Yes, Kate. That's a great question. Um, the book is called Hebrews, I believe, because it seems to be, um, I don't know the full answer. I'm going to take a stab, actually, because I don't know, I'm not, I'm taking a stab and it's not historical, so I haven't looked up the first usage of that and such. My guess is that because it it's, it's, seems to be written to, though I don't think that we can know the complete composure of this audience, a Jewish audience, who's tempted to go back to the synagogue. Although some, Greek, uh, some Gentiles did attach themselves as god fears to the synagogue and had certain privileges. And so it could be that, and those were some of the first converts, so it could be that they're also tempted to go back, but my guess is that that's it. Anybody have a better answer than that? What? Right, so that's, that's the, that would be the, yeah, that would be the suggestion that, that, the, that they're Jews who accepted Christ, or at least the majority of them are. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Any other questions? Good question. No. Okay. We'll keep going. So what was the temptation? We talked about this, that the temptation is to turn back. Uh, and we can see this here. It says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet with, uh, together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, let me, let me say a couple things about this verse. Before I tell you what this verse means, let me give some anecdotal suggest things so that I can have some credibility about what I tell you it means and not what it doesn't mean. Uh, I have a very high what's called ecclesiology, and uh, that means understanding of the church. And as soon as I started understanding God's purpose of the church and the world, uh, I started being extremely committed to the church, so much so that uh, I would say that it's my common practice. I might have missed going to church three Sundays in the last 10 or 12 years. I believe, kind of come, come, uh, come what may, unless you are deathly ill, you should be in church and you should find a church on a Sunday morning. Absolutely. I don't believe you should ever miss church. That's my conviction. Uh, having said that, when you've probably heard it said, when it, it um, you know, quoted up, let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting meeting together. When it's talking about not neglecting meet together as the habit of some, this is not talking about somebody who misses church on a Sunday or two. This is not what we're talking about. This is not the proof text for like, well, you need to be in church this Sunday. I think you need to be in church this Sunday. That's why I gave that end little story. Absolutely. These people are talking about totally leaving. Like, neglecting to meet the meeting together is the habit of some. These some are people who have gone. They stopped. This isn't like, I'm not going to church very often. This is like, I've left Christianity okay, and fallen away. And so that's the temptation here. The temptation is, is, not, to, is, is not that, you know, uh, 
to go to the kids' soccer game on Sunday instead of uh, church one Sunday or two. The temptation here is actually, like, to leave. Now, I think you should come to church and not the soccer game. I will say that. But that this text, we have to understand what the temptation is here, and it is, it is to actually leave completely because, the, because of the, the persecution that they're facing. So if that's, if that's the temptation, then what is the response and so Hebrews, you have to understand, is like a sermon. And it's like um, some of the best sermons you've probably heard. Have you ever heard that sermon? It's very famous where the guy talks and talks and talks, and then at the end he kind of has this tagline, and he says, it's Friday, but some, Sunday's coming. And he keeps going back to that. It's Friday, but so, Sunday's coming. And then he'll talk about bad things. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. And he's talking about, like, the death and resurrection of Jesus, right? It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Well, right, so the author of Hebrews does that. Uh, the, the whole thing is structured around, he does exposition of Old Testament text, and then he does what's called exhortation, where he basically says, do this, do this, do this. This is how it applies to your life. Or think about, like, a sermon where it was like, I don't know, you were talking about, the call of faith and the confirmation of faith and the continuation of faith. And then you exp- the preacher explained all these things. But then at the end of, of the explanation point, at every point, he kind of came back to really the same application where he said, and we must be people of faith. And we must be people of faith. And we must be people of faith, right? This is what's going on in the book of Hebrews. So you see that there's all this kind of explanation of Old Testament text. And then you find these exhortations. And I'm just going to go through them now and, uh, and see if we pick up a theme. But exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. It's 3.13. For one, therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. So let us fear lest any of you should have failed to reach it. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Let us therefore... Oh, let's just keep happening. Uh, Then we have, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. We are not moving fast enough. What is going on? My thing's wrong. All right, anyway. Uh, So then, uh, therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity or perfection. And we desire each of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And we desire each of you to show that the same earnestness to have the full... I'm, oh, that was the same one I just read. Sorry. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. But we are not those who shrink back and are destroyed, but those who have faith and persevere and preserve, sorry, their souls. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight of sin uh, which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. See uh, See that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if... They did not escape when they refused to warn them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. So did you get a theme as we were going through all that. And, I mean, it's, very, it's said in various ways at various times, but what do you think the kind of, 
what's the note or what feeling did you get? Maybe I should just ask that. What feeling did you get as we went through that? Okay, encouragement? An encouragement to persevere? Yeah. I th- pa- let us. Yes. Yes. So let us do this. Although, of course, you know, uh, well, who knows? He could be there in Rome, but he's probably somewhere else. It seems like he's in Corinth writing. But you're like, easy for you to say, dude. You're in Corinth. <laughs> Nero's in our backyard. <laughs> anyway, but yes, let us. Okay. So engagement, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it kind of, it kind of, in some ways, it sounds a little bit like a, I don't know, I kind of think of, I would like to have um, Jim Harbaugh read this, like, you know, like, with a lot of energy, like, in the same, like, the same energy that he has before a game, that's San Francisco 49ers coach, if you don't know, and he's kind of crazy, and he's known for being, like, he's got lots of energy, and so you just get this kind of, like, Let's do this. Who are, let's do this. We can do this. And so every time he's kind of coming back to this thing and he's saying in various ways, persevere, 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 persevere. So that's the, that's the message, uh, persevere. Uh, and the question I think is, uh, is, well, let me, let me, let me paint a picture then, kind of to wrap this all up. Um, picture that you're living in Rome. It's the first century. And you live in a slum, a tenement house that is some five stories above the ground. As you're sitting there, you have before you uh, a rotten apple, some sour wine, and bread. And that is your dinner. As you light a candle to try to see what you're doing to eat, rats scamper across the floor and they find their hiding spots in the cracks. The, through the thin walls of the really, really poorly built structure, you hear a baby crying next door and you hear also uh, two people who are struggling to make ends meet and they are screaming at one another at the top of their lungs. Married couple, maybe, maybe not. You hear two businessmen leading out of the house, and below you see a group of soldiers on march from Rome. The next day you get to your job, and you don't have a great job. You actually work in the market as a fruit vendor, but you don't own the place. You actually are just a hired servant, basically. You're not a slave, but you work there. But you you would be better off in a slave in a rich person's home because it's the slaves of rich people who come and they make demands on you from their rich clients or from their rich masters who say, no, they want this and this and this and this and this. All the while, your boss is completely um, denigrating you, harping at you, snapping at you, and most of it has to do with the fact that you're a Christian. Another employee throws you a bunch of sour grapes and says, and rotten grapes, and says, try these out and forsake your cannibalism. In the, in the meantime, uh, you realize that you need those grapes because that might be the only food you have that night. You've been thinking of giving up this whole Christian thing because you actually were a Jew and your, your father was a leader in the synagogue. He was actually one of the main preachers. And you miss your family during this time because you're lonely and things are hard and you don't even have them to go to. You have stopped attending these meetings, these Christian meetings, uh, because just was too much emotionally, and you're, worried, you're wondering if you should go back. But then someone gives word to you that you should go to this meeting uh, because it's important. And for whatever reason, you make the 20-minute trek across town 
after work. You show up there. There are about 20 other people. They're all tired from their works as well, most of them poor. A man shows up, and he says, uh, I have a message for you. I have a scroll. And uh, as you're sitting there, you see that he's got a smile on his face. You see another man who's the leader of this house church. He's very excited, and he says, I made sure that, that we got to read it first. And then at that moment, the man rolls down the scrolls, and he sa- scroll, and he says, I think this is a message you need to hear. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited that is more excellent than theirs. And then he gets to the end of this long section and says, Therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to by us, by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, distributed according to his will. That's the situation of the church who heard this letter. But that's a lot of our situations as well, because if you are thinking about turning away, if you have ever been tempted to turn away, if you know someone who is tempted to turn away, if you know someone who is drifting away, If you ever have that question, then this is a book for you. Because the message of this book is persevere. But of course, the question at the end of that is, why and how? And that's what we're going to look at the rest of our time. So, I like to bring you back. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for this time and your kindness uh, through your word. Uh, thank you that um, thank you that we do have better things to hope for, and thank you that we have been given an eternal city. And we do ask that um, we would hear you speaking, and we would be carried along, and that we would fix our eyes on Jesus. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. And so we need a vision of him. Give us that this week, we pray, and through the rest of our time together in these three weeks remaining. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming. If you've got any questions, feel free to come on up and let me know. Or, or stick around, talk, eat. Thanks. <laughs>